Our first speaker is one of the leaders in the field of NAD biology. Uh, I'm really, and he's also like one of the nicest people on the planet. So I'm really happy to uh, introduce Joe Bauer uh, to the stage. So please, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Morton. I'm gonna start by thanking all of the organizers. This has really been a fun meeting. Uh, I've really enjoyed myself here and there's been tons of great uh, speakers and old colleagues. It's been great to catch up with. So I'm going to tell you about some of our work on NAD. Uh, and the reason we originally got interested in this uh, is this diagram here on the slide. Um, there is not a whole lot of evidence in humans yet, but the evidence that exists um, strongly supports the idea that there is an age-related decline in NAD levels, uh, at least in some tissues. The examples here are, are skin, brain, muscle, and liver, um, all of these in human data. Uh, and so, of course, this has been recapitulated many times in rodent models, uh, and we are very interested in, in developing um, a, a lot more data to see exactly when and where uh, NAD levels are falling in humans. Uh, but this really creates the idea that it might be beneficial to supplement NAD and get back to a youthful level. So we've heard NAD discussed uh, a few times already, but we haven't heard a whole lot about what it does, um, which turns out to be pretty uh, important and complicated. Uh, so NAD really has two major facets that people have studied. It was discovered as a redox cofactor that mediates the cycle on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, where for, it powers things like uh, glycolysis, beta-oxidation, and the TCA cycle. It accepts the high-energy electrons and transfers them, for instance, to complex one of the electron transport chain in mitochondria to fuel respiration, to things like lactate dehydrogenase, where reducing power is needed to catalyze different biochemical reactions. Uh, and sort of because of these multiple roles in metabolism, there's no sustainable path to ATP generation that doesn't involve NAD. Uh, and it becomes pretty self-evident that no cell can survive without NAD. In fact, we know this, that even if you become severely deficient in NAD, that's fatal. Uh, that's the cause of the disease pellagra that was cured uh, by the discovery of vitamin B3, which is niacin and nicotinamide, uh, the precursors to NAD. On the left side of this diagram is the more recently appreciated role of NAD as a co-substrate for signaling uh, reactions. So things like PARPs, CD38, sirtuins, degrade NAD, release the nicotinamide moiety, uh, and throw various molecular switches within cells, signaling things like calcium homeostasis, uh, gene silencing and expression. And because we have these enzymes constantly degrading NAD as part of their signaling mechanism, uh, we have to have a salvage pathway that's active all the time in cells to regenerate NAD from nicotinamide. And the existence of these two opposing pathways creates the possibility that they're going to get out of whack at some point. So in different disease processes, or we think during the normal aging process, um, you can have uh, degradation of NAD that exceeds the capacity for synthesis, and you can potentially change the size of this NAD pool. Um, that may, in fact, have direct effects through these signaling enzymes, but at least my point of view uh, at the moment is that the most prominent effects that this is likely to have are by just decreasing the amount of this pool that's available for the energetic reactions on the right. This is the primary metabolic role of NAD, which I think is really the, the most essential. Uh, so in starting to think about ways that we could boost NAD. Some of the obvious things are we know there's a de novo pathway from tryptophan, uh, but this is not a really attractive way to supplement because tryptophan also is a precursor for neurotransmitters, uh, for immune modulators. Only about 1 60th of the tryptophan flux in your body is going through NAD. And so you can have a lot of unintended consequences if you try to supplement that way. Um, you can supplement niacin, uh, which is one of the vitamin B3 forms that has been done traditionally. This has some unpleasant side effects, including flushing, that leads some people to discontinue it, um, but it is effective in boosting NAD levels. You can also supplement nicotinamide, um, and there's been a bit of a hesitancy to do that, mainly based on the idea that nicotinamide also inhibits many of the enzymes that are NAD dependent, and so you might be shooting yourself in the foot a little bit, although there's, there's not a lot of evidence for that. But based on sort of having these various concerns with some of the other precursors, um, there's been a lot of excitement about the idea of now using nicotinamide mononucleotide, which is an intermediate in NAD synthesis, or, or nicotinamide riboside, which is an alternative precursor that can come in through this other arm of the pathway. And each of these molecules has the advantage that it's already ribosylated, and so you're bypassing this rate-limiting step catalyzed by NAMPT, which is also the most energetically costly. And this is an enzyme that's feedback inhibited by NAD levels itself. And so there's an intrinsic limit to how much NAD you can get coming from nicotinamide, um, but you can bypass that if you come in from the side with these other precursors. 
So a lot of people have had this idea at this point. Uh, there's way too much preclinical data for me to summarize in a 20-minute talk, but I'll just give you a few of the examples here that have been some of the things that have inspired most of the human clinical trials that are getting initiated. Uh, there have been pretty dramatic improvements in glucose homeostasis in many labs in mice. Um, so this is a glucose tolerance excuse me, a glucose tolerance test shown here on the left where we give an oral bolus of glucose and measure how fast the animals are able to clear it. Um, untreated diabetic animals are shown here in the black line on top and after a week of NMN treatment to boost NAD, um, you can see during this test they're able to get their glucose levels almost back down to the starting level, uh, so approaching the non-diabetic range again. Uh, in the center is a model of heart failure. So there have been, I think, nine distinct mouse models of heart failure treated now. And in every case, we get about a 50% recovery of function. So this is uh, fractional shortening that's being shown, which is essentially a shorthand for ejection fraction, uh, if you're doing sort of the quick and dirty version in mice. Uh, and this model, uh, you can see here in, in the uh, white bars, loses about half of its contractility. Uh, over the course of this study, if they were treated with an NAD booster, nicotinamide riboside in this case, you get about half of that function back. And that's pretty consistent with the other models that have been studied so far um, and, and has inspired some human trials at this point to look at heart failure. Uh, and finally, on the far right, uh, there have been improvements in cognition in a variety of Alzheimer's disease models now in rodents. Um, this is one of the first ones, which is why I chose it, and, and uh, it's just a, a novel object recognition task that's being shown. But you can see here the controls are already below this line of 50% chance of choosing the novel object, so they're completely unable to show any evidence of cognitive function at this point. And if they've been treated with nicotinamide riboside, they regain some ability to discriminate that novel object. Um, so all the data in, in rodents so far has looked pretty promising. There's multiple age-related indications that seem promising. Multiple human trials started to test many of these things. What's been a little bit more mixed is the results of the human trials that, that have reported so far. Uh, and here, for example, on the, on the left is one of the first trials with nicotinamide riboside in humans looking at insulin sensitivity. And what you're measure, measuring here on the graph is glucose infusion rate during a hyperinsulinemic clamp. So you infuse insulin uh, signal for glucose uptake, and then measure how much glucose you have to provide to keep the person from getting hypoglycemic. Uh, and without going into the groups here, the, you can see that the, all the lines are overlapping. So with or without nicotinamide riboside, before or after treatment, uh, the insulin sensitivity looks exactly the same, uh, in contrast to the mice, where it looks like you're pretty much curing diabetes with this strategy. Uh, on the right-hand side uh, is a trial that was designed to look at muscle function, mitochondrial function and strength in muscle. And you can see oxygen consumption here uh, across the three groups, treated or untreated. Um, and it really doesn't change at all. If you look at grip strength, there's nothing at all. If you look at secondary endpoints in this study, one of them was inflammation. So expression of inflammatory cytokines, and, and that was significantly uh, improved. Many different inflammatory cytokines were downregulated by the treatment here. And that's kind of been the theme of the human studies so far. There are beneficial effects. Uh, many secondary trials are coming out of them to sort of pursue what was found in the end. But in many cases, it's not what you would have predicted from the rodent models. And in general, the effect sizes are much smaller. And so while I do think it's important to continue these trials and that there's many beneficial indications we may get with the current strategies, I think it also highlights the point that we really don't know a lot about how these effects are working. NAD has all these about 500 different reactions that are well characterized that are NAD dependent in cells. Um, and in most cases, we have no idea which one's taking place uh, that's relevant to the effects. We don't know which tissues or cells are mediating the effects of the supplements. And so, for instance, one of the first things that was reported was that NAD supplements were boosting endurance in mice. We've shown since genetically that if you do that specifically in skeletal muscle, that's not enough to confer the effect. And it's probably mediated through a hypothalamic circuit. Uh, and so some of the assumptions we're making in many cases when we try to move into humans may be incorrect. And we really need to understand what the target tissue or cell type that we're trying to boost NAD in is if we want to be able to evaluate these human studies and understand if we're getting the same mechanisms engaged. Uh, we need to know a lot more about how the, the precursors are metabolized in vivo. So we've been doing a lot of this kind of work in mice, and the answers have been really surprising in many cases. Uh, oral precursors are ending up in the microbiome, uh, getting disassembled, rings separated, and, and reassembled by the time they show up in tissue NAD pools. Um, and it really um, argues that it's going to dramatically affect the outcome depending on how you deliver these things um, and maybe what your microbiome composition is at the time when you're delivering them. So we need this kind of data in humans, which we don't have yet, um, but I think is going to be really important to understand exactly what we're doing in these supplementation trials. 
Um, I think this is the point I already made, that there's at least 500 reactions that are NAD dependent, and in almost no cases we know which one we think is being affected uh, for these beneficial effects. It's almost all cases of supplement the whole body with as much NAD as you can get in, in the rodents, and then we see a beneficial outcome. So we, we really need to get down to this nitty-gritty level of knowing what the target is that we can evaluate in humans. Um, and finally, the last point that I'm going to focus on today is uh, understanding which pools of NAD within the cell are most critical. We know there's at least five distinct pools of NAD within the cell that are membrane-bound and separate. Um, they're obviously being used for different types of metabolism or different metabolic processes within those different compartments. And in almost every case, we're actually looking at a mashed up piece of tissue when we determine the NAD levels um, and not understanding whether we might have hit a target organelle. So one of the ones that I think is the most interesting to follow up on for this point is mitochondria. And I'll show you some evidence here, even from that first slide where I showed the cycles. Uh, much of the NAD catalyzed metabolism is taking place inside the mitochondria. Um, and this is evidence that one of the first things we see in a lot of the cells treated with NAD boosters is an improvement in mitochondrial respiration. In this case, they were treated just for five hours. So this is about the time when the NAD level in the cell peaks. And even by that time, before you've had a whole lot of time for remodeling the proteome or anything like that, um, you can immediately see a, a boost in mitochondrial respiratory capacity, either in the intact cells um, or if we isolate the mitochondria uh, and then, then look at their ability to respire maximally. So based on that line of thinking, we got interested a few years back in understanding how mitochondria get NAD. And at the time, there were three ideas in the field. Um, either that mitochondria just completely synthesize their own, that they take up nicotinamide mononucleotide as an intermediate and complete the synthesis, um, or that they directly import NAD from the cytosol. And so we were able to show with tracer studies uh, that at least this third pathway exists and seems to be critical for many cell types. We can't rule out the possibility that these first two happen under certain circumstances, uh, but we think this third one is really the major mechanism, that there's a direct uptake. And based on those tracer studies, we began searching for one. Uh, and in 2020, uh, we, along with Nora Corey's group uh, and the Superti, uh, Superti Ferga group um, here in Europe, uh, simultaneously reported that SLC 25A51 uh, is that mitochondrial NAD transporter in mammalian cells. And so this is just the proof of principle experiment with the HAP1 cells, where we've looked at whole cell NAD, which is completely unchanged by knocking out this gene. Uh, but if you isolate mitochondria from those cells, you can see it's, it's, the NAD is really uh, at a very low level. And as you might predict from that, if we look at oxygen consumption as a measure of mitochondrial function in these cells, uh, it's near zero all the time. So this is uh, data from a seahorse. This is oxygen consumption rate, and we're putting the cells through their paces with uh, uh, different uh, inhibitors and activators of mitochondrial function in the wild type, but you don't need to know those because the, the knockout cells are just dead the whole time. They, they really can't respire at all, even though they are in fact alive and continue to proliferate, powered completely by gly glycolysis. So that's a bit of an extreme example because there's almost no NAD in the mitochondria. Um, but we can also show that in hepatocytes or hepatocyte-derived cell lines, if we use shRNA to knock down the transporter here, so only by about 50%, uh, we can get a, a decrease in the NAD pool that looks a little bit more reasonable and physiological. In fact, uh, if we look at circadian rhythms, you get about this much variation uh, in NAD levels to begin with. And that's also sufficient to limit mitochondrial respiratory capacity. So you can see here a, a drop in the OCR that is about proportional to the drop in NAD in those mitochondria. And so we think that hepatocyte mitochondria, at least, are really acutely sensitive to the amount of NAD that's present, and it really limits the amount of flux that's possible through the organelles. And so having this information in hand, it allows us for the first time to ask whether shifting NAD into the mitochondria is sufficient to reproduce the effects of supplementation. So we really wanted to ask if you, if you don't boost NAD everywhere, in fact, you don't even increase the total amount of NAD, but you just increase the amount that's in the mitochondria so they can respire better, will that be sufficient to explain some of the beneficial effects that we see with the different supplementation strategies? And the system we chose to do that in was liver regeneration with a two-thirds partial hepatectomy. And we chose this because we had seen um, robustly over many sets of experiments that this system stresses the NAD pool, NAD levels fall in the regenerating liver, and that if you supplement NAD levels, in this case with nicotinamide riboside, um, you can accelerate the rate of recovery and of liver regeneration, both at the number of replicating hepatocytes, at the liver weight to body weight ratio, and if you look histologically, it's just kind of a night and day response in terms of being able to deplete all the fat droplets that accumulate in the regenerating liver uh, and being able to pick out more uh, dividing cells. As you can see, there's one here in the center. 
We were also excited about using this system in particular uh, because we had observed previously that there is a response in the regenerating liver to relocate NAD to the mitochondria. So this is the whole liver NAD result that I mentioned, where when you regenerate, NAD is dropping. Uh, but if you look at the mitochondria from the same time point, uh, NAD is actually going up, even though the total pool is going down. So it seems like the liver actually, in response to the re regeneration, wants to put more NAD into the mitochondria. So this is the experiment that we set up to test the hypothesis. Uh, we used viral overexpression of SLC25A51 in the livers of mice, uh, and then without adding any supplementation, just shifting their endogenous NAD into the liver, um, asked whether that would promote regeneration the same way that NAD supplements do. Um, so this is just the demonstration that the, we don't really affect whole liver NAD. You're looking at the blue bars here compared to the black. Um, and if you look at mitochondrial NAD isolated from hepatocytes, that is actually uh, significantly higher in the animals that are transduced. Uh, and I'm not sure, well, you can see the whole liver data, but here's the data, which essentially says that just shifting NAD into the mitochondria without adding any more to the system is sufficient to completely recapitulate the benefit that we see with nicotinamide riboside. So here's liver weight to body weight ratio again. Here's the mitotic index, the number of replicating hepatocytes. Uh, and if you look histologically here, you can see again, it looks really just like the effects that we get from, from uh, nicotinamide riboside supplementation. And so this really seems to be the key effect that we're getting uh, is pushing a little bit of NAD into the mitochondria when we supplement. Um, here's the data just showing that NAD levels do remain high, both pre- and post-hepatectomy. Uh, uh, and NADH uh, follows about the same pattern, so there's not a major shift in the redox state, the ratio between NAD and NADH. Uh, there's really just more of both and about the same ratio uh, that's maintained throughout the regeneration process. Uh, and that translates to increased activity uh, of complex one in the mitochondria or increased total complex one dependent respiration. So we see that even pre-hepatectomy, uh, so consistent with the cell culture data, if we boost NAD levels, we do get a statistically significant but subtle increase in mitochondrial respiratory capacity to begin with. Uh, and then after the hepatectomy, uh, as NAD levels are falling, uh, we start to lose capacity, but we can dramatically restore that by having more NAD in the mitochondria, uh, which is consistent with it being able to regenerate better. Uh, finally, this is some in-progress data using uh, heterozygous mice for A51, uh, which I thought was important to show just, again, to make this argument that hepatocytes are sitting at that level of NAD where they really are acutely sensitive to small changes. So even heterozygosity for this gene, which I thought wouldn't be enough to do anything, um, actually is strongly trending towards lowering uh, mitochondrial NAD in the liver and has all the opposite phenotypes to what we see with overexpression in the liver. Um, so, so either up or down regulating the amount of NAD in hepatocyte mitochondria seems completely sufficient to to mediate this phenotype. And so with that, I will just conclude and say I hope I've convinced you that mitochondrial uh, respiration is sensitive to NAD levels and hepatocytes in both directions. Uh, mitochondrial NAD levels that we set by the gene expression of SLC25A51 seem to be sufficient to determine liver regeneration in vivo. A and that we think mitochondrial NAD may be the relevant therapeutic target uh, and, and many other applications which we're interested in testing, but we really want to see how general this paradigm turns out to be. Uh, and if this is the case, mitochondrial NAD is a small fraction of tissue NAD, and, and so the surrogates that we're using to, to evaluate supplementation may not be the right ones if it's really the mitochondrial NAD that we need to know. I think I have one more slide, which I will just quickly say was just in here is another example of a case where we think there may be a, a bit of a conserved stress response to allocate NAD to mitochondria. Um, so we've seen in a few situations, and, and this example is hemorrhagic shock, uh, where, again, that same thing that happens in the regenerating liver happens. Total tissue NAD starts to fall, uh, but mitochondrial NAD simultaneously goes up. Uh, and so we think this, this really may, may be the way tissues react to stress under some conditions when they need uh, to be in a situation where they're going to generate a lot of energy and repair. So with that, I will stop and thank the people in the lab who did the work. Uh, I should particularly point out to Mr. Mukherjee, who did all the uh, liver regeneration work and brought that technique to the lab, uh, as well as uh, Tim Luongo and Tony Davila, who, who pioneered all the, uh, the work on the transporter. Um, so thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs>Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. I, I was wondering whether I can ask you a practical question. So let's say you're doing a, a study, a randomized controlled trial with NAM. 
and uh, you want to see whether there are changing biomarkers in the blood. What kind of biomarker you will be selecting to see and understand whether you know, the target has been engaged or if the, the, if the, you know, the supplementation is somewhat effective? Yeah, so, so I get this question like three times a day, uh, and, and this is, I mean, exactly why I'm saying we need to understand a lot more what the target really is in many of these mouse models, right? Without knowing which biochemical pathway is affected or, or where you need to see the NAD level go up, um, we really don't have good biomarkers. And I think you see that in the human studies that come out, that they, they measure NAD in the blood. The cytokines? Yeah, well, so I, so I do think that that can be developed as a potential biomarker because it does look like that's a pretty consistent response to the supplements. But I can give you another example too, just in, in my example here, right? If, if it's hepatocyte NAD levels and flux through hepatocytes, we see that that correlates really well with ketone generation. And, and so we, we can get an index, you know, in the fasting state of you know, your ketogenesis level will actually go up as a, as a marker of having more mitochondrial NAD. Um, so I think, uh, you know, as we start to understand the mechanisms, we can design these biomarkers rationally, but but I think at the moment we don't really have anything validated besides blood and AD levels. <laughs> Great talk, thank you. Um, we're seeing a proliferation of clinics that are selling intravenous NAD, at least in California. Um, I just wanted to know, and, and Josh Rabinovitz had published a paper saying that IV administered NAD in mice actually just goes to the liver and is cleaved into nicotinamide and ADP ribose. Uh, is there any data in humans in terms of, and people, I mean, who actually, and I, I've, I've known a number of people who do this, claim that they, they, they feel an immediate effect, whether it's placebo or true, we don't know. But uh, is there any biology on, on the, the pharmacokinetics of IV administered uh, NAD? There, there is absolutely nothing that I'm aware of. Uh, so I've been, I've been very curious about this. So, so first of all, the, the data with Josh, which we worked together on that, uh, and it was nicotinamide riboside or mononucleotide administered intravenously. Uh, that we did actually see that go into tissues and, and boost the NAD pools uh, more effectively than if we gave them orally. But there was no intact NAD in that study. And in fact, our long-term collaborator, Marie Magode, who makes a lot of these isotope-labeled um, compounds, is in the process right now of making NAD with labels everywhere so we can do that intravenous experiment and ask if that does anything different than, than supplementing um, NR or NMN. Uh, but at the moment, I, I've been shocked at how, little, how there is zero data on the effects of, of uh, intravenous NAD with any, any, in any kind of controlled study. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Joe. Right. Great talk. Thank you.